Acts chapter 7, verse 22. This is the writer of Acts' description of Moses, the mighty man of God. He said, And Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Now, y'all listen to me. Now, notice when he was describing Moses, he said, Moses, you had the ability to talk. You had power in your speech. That was somebody's observation of Moses. But now I want you to go to Exodus chapter 4, verse 10 up on the screen. I want you to look at it. I want you all to see this. And Moses said to the Lord, watch this now. Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither here before or since you've spoken unto me. But I'm slow of speech, and I have a slow tongue. When the writer of Acts described Moses, he said he was a powerful speaker. But when Moses described himself, he said, I can't talk a lick. And many people have looked at these two passages of Scripture and said that the Bible is full of contradiction. Many skeptics and many agnostics look at this to try to disqualify the Word of God when in actuality this shows the beauty and the power of the Word of God, which I tried to get to Sunday morning and the Spirit of God began to move in another way. So we're just going to push it on out tonight. I want to preach in a little while from the subject of the contradiction part two, the contradiction the thing in your life that tries to talk you out of your faith. The thing in your life that tries to beat you down on your best day. I know we like to come to church and talk about all the blessings and all the good. But every now and then we need to talk about the thing that you're afraid to talk about. That struggle you have in your faith. That worry you have over your children. That battle you've got going on on the inside and you don't know where to turn. Because in every life we've got things that make us come to church. That's why I can't wait to come on Wednesday night because I know I'm going to be preaching to some people that are here because they know God's real. I know that I'm going to get the opportunity to preach to people that believe in a big God just like I do. I know I'm going to get the opportunity to preach to people that haven't just heard about God, but they've heard from God. I can't get no help in here. I love Wednesday nights because I'm surrounded by people that have had an experience with God. And you can't talk somebody out of an experience with God. But just as surely as you've got things that make you want to raise your hands and say, thank you, Jesus. Just as surely as you've got things that make you want to come to church and, and pay honor to the Lord and be around believers. We've all, I'm just going to go ahead and tell it. We've all got things in our life that we don't like talking about. We've all got things in our life that we're struggling with behind the scenes. Say, man, somebody. So many times people see the stage presentation, but they have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And I'm preaching to some people right now that your stage presentation is tight and it's solid and it looks good, but behind the scenes you feel like you're unraveling. Behind the scenes you feel like you're coming unglued. When Carlene was up here talking and Veronica went to that church, when Sherry went to that church, many of us went to that church, I remember as a young Christian sitting there and feeling like I was coming unglued, but I'd come in that church, I'd shake hands, I'd hug on people, I'd worship God, and nobody knew that I was battling some stuff, and I may be a preacher now, and I've been saved all these years, but can I tell you, I still He'll go through some stuff from time to time. But one thing I've learned over my 23 years with the Lord is my God is faithful. And when I can't hold on to him, he still holds on to me. Have I got anybody in here that said every now and then it got too tough for me to hold on? But God was faithful and held on to me. We've got to tell people that God will hold you through the storms because we all sit in church and the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God moves on you and he wants to remind you of the good things God's done of the time the car wreck didn't kill you, of the time that the bad thing you worried about happening didn't happen, of that thing that used to consume you, how God just moved it out of the way. The Spirit of God will remind you of those things and your faith will begin to increase. But just as surely as the voice of God wants to speak to your face, faith, the voice of the enemy wants to speak to your fear. The voice of the enemy doesn't want you praising God that you were able to come to church. If you can't praise God, you're here. You ought to praise God. Greg's here. Greg couldn't wait to get to the house of God. The enemy don't want you focused that God's brought you to another Christmas season. The enemy doesn't want you focused that you have people in your life that love you unconditionally. The enemy doesn't want you focused on the fact that if God didn't want you alive, he wouldn't have woke you up this morning. 
No, the enemy ain't going to focus you upon that stuff that builds your faith to make you say, I'm going to make it. The enemy wants to focus on this guy. Oh, yeah. You see, because as I turn here, I see living, breathing people. Y'all go ahead and share this on Facebook if you want to because I believe God wants to speak to some people right now. As I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to living, breathing people. I can put my hand on Robbie. There's a heartbeat. I can put my hand on Lakin and I can feel heat upon the top of her head because Lakin is alive and God called me and put me on planet earth to preach to you. But just as surely as I'm preaching to you, if you could see in the spirit, there's always this guy behind me. There's always this guy trying to get my attention because he knows if I focus on him, I can't bless them. I'm trying to help somebody. The enemy's always got a skeleton in the closet. The enemy's always got a voice of the enemy that tries to distract you from the people you're assigned to and focus on something that don't even matter. The enemy loves to get dad's focus on some dead thing, on some miserable thing. Get them so focused on this thing that don't matter that they can't love the people that do matter. I've seen many preachers that were assigned to congregations, but the devil would captivate their attention and they would begin to focus on the things of yesterday, focus on the mistakes of the past, focus on present weaknesses, and they would begin to spend so much energy on that that they were unable to help the ones God has called them to. See, life is a battle about attention. My assignment is to give you my attention and a word from God. So don't think the devil don't jerk out this guy and try to get me thinking, well, what did they say about you? Well, why did this person leave you? Well, what does that person think about you? Well, what about this? I, I can't be real in here, can I? What about this weakness, pastor? What about this struggle, pastor? And I found out when I started looking Looking at him, I lose my ability to help people the way that I want to because what I look at longest becomes strongest in my life. God put an anointing on me to preach to people, but the voice of the enemy is always trying to turn me around and get me to focus on something that I can get no life from. Holler back at me if you've ever had that struggle. Has the devil ever tried to bring up your past? Has he ever tried to torment your mind? Has he ever tried to tell your family? wasn't going to make it. I can't get no help in here. The enemy, I've got living people. i got my man Clifford here. I'm called to preach to Clifford. What if I'm focused on this guy? What are you focused on that's keeping you from your assignment? What memory? What baggage? What secret struggle? What skeleton is it that the voice of the enemy keeps calling you Back to, I'm going to get to Moses in a minute, but i got to lay a foundation. This is why Paul said, because Paul was called to a great congregation. Paul was called to write two-thirds of the New Testament. But behind Paul, there was a skeleton. He said he was chief of all sinners. He said he was the most wretched that ever lived. That's what he said in the Bible. He's got even you beat. He said, but God saved me, that I could be an example that if he saved me, he could save anybody and that people would believe after me. But Paul always had the temptation to look back. Paul always had the voice of the enemy saying, you can't go forward because of what's behind you. Have you ever had the enemy try to tell you that your past has destroyed your purpose in God? Just wave at me right now. That's why Paul in Philippians chapter 3 said this one thing I do. He said, I forget those things which are behind and I reach to those things which are before and I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ. I just come to talk to somebody. You got to let it go. You got to quit looking at it. You got to quit trying to breathe life into it. God took it away from you. He didn't let it kill you. He didn't let it destroy you. Somebody give him a praise the city on the hill right now. But Paul knew there would always be the temptation to look back. And as I preach to you, child of God, I've got to be honest with you, there'll always be the temptation to look back. Even the Lord Jesus said, he that layeth his hand on the plow and looketh back. What voices try to call you 
back? What contradictions do you have in your life that try to talk you out of it? Paul was a man that God apprehended, that God got a hold of, but Paul was blinded by the meeting. And God sent a person by the name of Ananias who prayed for him and the scales fell off his eyes. See, when God wants to bless you and break the chain of your yesterday and release you into your tomorrow, he will always send people that cause the scales to fall off of your eyes. Why aren't people saved? Because they're blind. Why aren't people coming to church tonight? Because they're blinded. They believe God's a mean God. They believe God's done with them. They believe God won't forgive them of their sins. How many of you used to believe those lies of the devil? And God will send people into your life that are anointed to help you see clearly. The reason I don't preach politics and the reason I don't preach a lot of stuff going on around in the community is because my assignment is to cause blind people to see that we got a good, good God. My assignment is to tell hurting people that he is a healer, broken people that he is a deliverer, cast down people that he is a way maker. I need somebody to give God a praise if you know they need to see him. Woo! Bible said he is altogether lovely. When you begin to behold the beauty and the glory of God, you begin to realize, I, I can't take my eyes off of him. The devil hates that because when you're looking at Jesus, you have faith because you realize how good he is, how powerful he is. But if the enemy can get your eyes off of him, off of what he called you to do, and get you focused on things that don't matter. Paul had this person that prayed for him, scales fell off, but nobody would let him preach. Just like you wouldn't let somebody preach if they'd killed your grandparents or killed your parents because of the gospel. So God sent a man by the name of Barnabas who said, I believe in you. Some people, you know all they need to make it is just one person to believe in them. Sometimes all anybody needs is just one person to say, you know what? I believe in you. Thomas Edison was sent to school by his mother, and he loved school. He loved playing with the other kids. But one day when class was over, the teacher handed him a note and said, Thomas, make sure you hand this to your mother. And he said, okay. She said, now make sure you give it to your mother. He said, yes, ma'am, I will. And he ran home, and he handed the note to his mother. His mother opened it up, and tears began to stream down her face. And he said, mother, why are you crying? What does it say? And she said, Thomas, it says your son is so gifted, so intelligent, that this school cannot help him, that this school is too limited to teach somebody as gifted as your son it is my responsibility to teach you at home from this moment on. That made Thomas feel so special. Thomas Edison was homeschooled by his mother, and he believed that there was something special about him because his mama told him there was something special about him. And years later, he became famous. He was the mind of the century, and that mother that believed in him passed away. And he went to her place, and he was gathering up tears in his eyes, and all of a sudden on the old bookshelf, he saw that old corner of that letter he had carried when he was a kid. And just for kicks, he was going to open it up and read how that teacher had bragged on him. And when he opened up that letter, it said, Mrs. Edison, we regret to inform you that your son is mentally deficient and will be unable to attend our school. He is hereby expelled. Thomas Edison began to cry. And he pinned down in his journal, and it's recorded under this day. He said, Thomas Edison, a mentally deficient child whose mother turned him into the genius of the century. <laughs> what would happen if you believed in somebody? Sometimes, what if Thomas's mother would have came in agreement with what the teacher said? Life will always attack your strength and try to get you to come in agreement with the wrong thing. But Barnabas said, I believe in you, Paul. And Paul began to preach. But in, in 2 Corinthians 7 verse 5, Paul said he was going through battles on the outside and battles on the inside. And I've been stuck on that a while because that spoke to me because I know what it's like to be fighting battles out there and battles in here trying to preach and people coming against you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Trying to do what God called you to do and going through things. But the biggest battles you fight are on the inside, the stuff you can't even tell nobody about. And you're fighting stuff out here and you're fighting stuff in there. And the apostle Paul said he got discouraged. If the man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament got discouraged, there's a good chance every now and then I'm going to have to deal with discouragement. There's a good chance every now and then you're going to have to deal with discouragement. 
But what did God do to deal with Paul's discouragement? I feel my help coming. He didn't send a 12-foot angel. He didn't open the Red Sea and send a fleet of an army. He sent a boy by the name of Titus. And Paul said, by the time Titus was done talking to us, we felt the comfort of the Holy Ghost. I just want somebody to know when God wants to encourage you, he'll send somebody. Somebody, all you need is a Titus to come into your life. Do you know what the name Titus means? The name Titus means you can make it and I just come to tell somebody that's been struggling going through a hard time tonight you can make it God can bring you through we've all got contradictions we've all got things we deal with keep going forward you've come too far to give up now somebody give him a praise if you know you can make it this guy will always be lurking in the background won't you no matter how hard I preach no matter how many years I serve the Lord, you'll always be there, won't you? You'll always be trying to get my attention off of my assignment and on to you. But you only have the power that I give you. He only has the power you give him. He only has the power you give him. He can't just reach out and grab you. He's a dead man. Dad told me one time, I don't like going through graveyards. He said, bugs, it ain't the dead. You got to worry about it. It's the people that's alive. So many times we let dead things talk us out of our anointing, talk us out of our passion. Moses on the backside of a desert. When he was in Egypt, he learned how to talk like an Egyptian. Walk like and all that stuff. He learned how to walk like an Egyptian. He learned how to look like an Egyptian. In fact, the Bible said he was a great speaker because in Egypt they judge your intelligence by your ability to speak publicly and they love public speakers. They love people that can move people with their words and, and move crowds and Moses according to scripture it was able to do this but something had happened to Moses on them 40 years after that murder where he was on the run from the law. Moses developed a stutter. See the enemy will always try to attack the part of you that makes you strong. Just like he attacked Thomas Edison, tried to make his mother believe there was nothing special about him. That his mind didn't possess anything that could change the world. The enemy doesn't wait till you get saved to attack your strength. Come on somebody. The enemy can sense how God's going to use you at a young age and try to crush your spirit. I've got somebody very close to me right now that won't get up on stage and won't do nothing all because at a young age this person got wounded by somebody that should have helped them. The enemy will try to come to you and make you feel like you're a nobody. The enemy will try to come to you. It might have been through a teacher. It might have been through a coach. It might have been through some family or loved ones. I don't know, but the enemy knows if God's going to bless you through people, the enemy tries to wreck you through people. But I've I've got good news for you. The word of God can undo everything their words did to you. For 40 years. 40 years and that's all Moses had was the memories. Moses lost that ability to speak according to Moses. Moses lost that ability. His trials have made him a bit nervous. His trials have made his tongue unsteady. The trauma of his life had seemed to change him. And now Moses stood in the presence of a mighty God who was calling him into something great. And Moses had the audacity to say, I've got nothing to offer because I've got a stutter. I come to preach to you a stutter right now. Because when Stephen described him, he said, man, he could speak. But when Moses described him, he, when he described himself, he said, I, I can't talk a lick. Ain't it funny how sometimes other people can see in you what you don't see in yourself. Because that wasn't God talking, that was Moses when he said, I couldn't speak. But it was the inspiration of God when Stephen said he could speak. See, sometimes if I were to come to you and say, what do you have to offer you? You'd say, I got nothing. I've got a past. I've got a boneyard of skeletons. I've got nothing to offer. i, I got nothing that can help nobody. Maybe you just need some people in your life that can see in you what you don't see in yourself. I wouldn't be behind this pulpit today if God hadn't sent some people that saw something in me when I didn't see anything in myself. And my job, I've said, God, anoint me to see the treasure you put in people. I want to cause you to believe in God and I want to cause you to believe in the gift.
gift that God Almighty put in you. Somebody give God a praise if you believe there's something in you. Because nothing shifts when you just believe that there's something in God. We know that. But when you dare to believe that you are what the Bible said, fearfully and wonderfully made, you become dangerous to hell when you dare to believe that greater works than these shall you do. When you dare to believe that the Spirit of God now dwells in your mortal bodies. When you dare to believe that no matter how nasty your skeleton was, I feel my preach coming on. No matter how dark it was, no matter how distant or how near it was, that it is not greater than the blood of Jesus. <laughs> I don't care how bad he stinks. I don't care what people would think about it. He has no power in the presence of God. He cannot abort your purpose. Somebody ought to praise God right there. I know you're at church, but you ought to give him a hallelujah anyhow. I'm looking for some crazy praise sometimes. There was this man, he would come to church and he would dance. With this church in Texas, he would dance as soon as the music would start. He would raise his hands and he would dance. And the pastor's son and a group of young people got to noticing how he would dance and how he would just wave back and forth. You know, he wasn't knocking pews over and hurting people and doing crazy stuff. He was just dancing to the Lord. Like, and that's totally acceptable and good. But these young kids, they started judging him. They started thinking, why is he so crazy? So they'd wait for service to start and they'd watch him and say, Oh, look at him. Here he goes. There goes that one hand. There go his feet. And they'd get tickled at him. But one day the pastor said, I want him to come up here and I want, I want you to tell this congregation your story. Because the pastor knew his story. The man walked up on the stage and tears streaming down his face. He said, when I was born, I never knew my father. Never met my father. He said, and my mother committed suicide when I was at a young age. He said, and I was raised on the streets, and I was bitter, and I was angry, and I'd done evil things. He said, but when I came to this church, it gave me hope. He said, I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and he turned my life around, and he used this church to help me and bless me. He said, and I can't help it every time I hear the music. I can't help but give God a praise. See, don't judge somebody's praise till you know what they've been through. Don't judge how somebody loves God until you know how far down they were when they grabbed a hold of them. In fact, you ought to give God a praise that he was good to them. Because if he did it for them, he'll do it for you. I feel something breaking in here. I feel God just trying to move in somebody's life. Not trying. When God moves, he moves. But this guy, he's whispering. Ah, oh, pastor, don't know about you. See, I'm not called to know about your skeleton. In fact, the Bible said for me to know no man after the flesh. That's what the Bible said. I ain't supposed to know how many times you got married, how many, how many times you've been locked up. God said, none of that matters when he gets a hold of your life. It's not about knowing them after the flesh. It's about knowing them after the spirit. It becomes the job of the church not to see how many skeletons you have, how many flaws you have, how many contradictions you have. If you get to know anybody long enough, you're going to see some contradictions. I don't care who it is. I don't care how spiritual they are, how big a Bible they pack. Until we go to heaven, we're all going to have to deal with flesh from time to time. And you need to be saying amen about right now or I'm going to do an altar call for the spirit of fibbing. But the enemy, see what he'll do is he'll try to get people to focus on that part of you. He'll try to get you to focus on that part of you. He'll try to do anything he can to keep you from focusing on the very thing that God put you on the planet to do. And then you've wasted days and weeks and months and years. I wonder how many people have wasted a lot of their life hanging around this guy when they've got a family that would love to talk to him. Hanging around this guy when they've got a mission. And the reason they feel so unfulfilled on planet Earth is because they're not doing what God put them on the planet to do. 
You remember the manic of the Gadarenes? He hung around the dead things. He hung around the tombs and he went crazy. You keep hanging around stuff that the blood's already taken care of and it'll drive your nervous system up the wall. It'll break down your health and your mental stability. God sent me here to tell you, you ain't got to live like that. God is not bringing up this guy. God is saying, get up, shake it off, and go forward. Do I have anybody that feels like going forward tonight? I want to forget those things which are behind. I want to reach to those things which are before, and I want to press for the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. As Cody begins to play, let me do this right here. Everybody stand to your feet. We've all got contradiction. I told you about Smith Wigglesworth, how he would preach and lay hands on people and they'd get healed, documented miracles, healings. 14 people documented, raised from the dead. Early 1900s preacher from England. But he would go home from those meetings sometimes and he would have severe kidney stones and he would lay there for hours. And in those moments, that's when the contradiction hit. Because can't you just hear the enemy saying, how could God use you to help them and he lets you lay here. Have you ever had one of those moments where the enemy says, yeah, you've got this going on, but what about this? What about your mom and dad being sick, Lord? What about this going on? What about this struggle? What about this guy? This guy is in the background. And he only has to be as big a part of my life as I let him. But if you start listening to the wrong voices, they'll magnify this guy, this situation, and he'll look bigger than all the blessings that God has bestowed upon you. I want you to lift your hands to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because the great thing about the Spirit of God and worshiping with the people of God is he diminishes the sound of that guy. It's the job of the church to get you free from the effects of that God where you're no longer hanging your head in shame. You're no longer beating yourself up. You're no longer feeling less than. God didn't put you on planet Earth and keep you alive so that you could feel less than the rest of your life. The Spirit of God is in this place. This guy has received enough of your attention. He has received enough of your time, your talent, your energy. He's took enough time away from your family. He's took enough time away from your gifting. It's time to turn from this guy. Say, God, I want to forget those things. And I want to start going forward. If you're in here tonight, and I believe there are people are that they just need to shake some things off. This skeleton represents something to you that matters tonight. That you say, tonight, tonight, I want to draw a line in the sand and say, I'm going past it. I'm not going to let it beat me down. I'm not going to let it drive me back anymore. I'm going forward. If that's you, I want you to step out of your seat right now because the decision is ultimately not God's or the devil's, it's yours. Will you be captivated by him or will you be captivated by your purpose and the God that gave it to you? If that's you, you need to step out of your seat right now as the Spirit of God moves. I feel God wanting to separate somebody from this guy. I feel God wanting to get somebody away from this guy. He's taking enough of your energy, enough of your passion, enough of the things that people need out of you. This world needs you to be you. You can hand somebody a copy of a document and it don't have any power. It takes the original document. See, you're an original. But the enemy's tried to beat you down and make you a copy of everybody else because you feel like you're worthless and you ain't got nothing to offer. The devil's a liar. There's some more people in here right now and I'm going I'm to finish just a little while longer. If that's you, you need to come right now. Don't let this guy walk out of this building with you. Don't let this guy have the same power he's had over you. You need to come right now. I knew when I released that on Facebook and the response came that God was going to bring people, that God was speaking to people. And this is your moment. This is your time. One more time if that's you. While the Spirit of God is moving, I'm saying step out of your seat right now. Come up here because I want to pray for you.